The fourth area of reform is in the involvement in training and professional conferences. When schools introduced the use of technology in their classrooms, teachers were trained in what technology is for education, how technology can be used for education, and then teachers went and tried different things in their classrooms. Some things worked, some things didn't work. Teachers kept logs and diaries of what happened, what went well, what didn't go well. And over time, over the span of a semester or a term, they learned a lot. Now, what a great way, what a great resource to use to teach other teachers about the use of technology. When these teachers who had excelled in the use of technology, had suffered with the use of technology, now had anecdotes and remedies to present. What a wonderful chance to do it at a national or an international conference. So it opened up avenues and doors for teachers, for school teachers, particularly that previously were not open. School teachers normally don't go and attend conferences. But when you do something like this, when there is all this wealth of information and knowledge that teachers have gathered through their own experiences of using technology in the classroom, what a great way to help other teachers learn and benefit. In education, things need to be multiplied instead of being divided and subtracted. What a great way to warn teachers, to help teachers who are struggling and beginning and wanting to use technology in their classrooms with real-life experiences from real classrooms, from real teachers. The fifth area of reform is adequate technology access is needed for all students. We started with technology, even in the developed world, with maybe one or two or three computers or laptops in a classroom. We never started, even in the real world, with every student having their own device. That was not possible. But over time, what we learned was that the more time students spent with the gadget, with the machine, using a particular application or software, they learned better. So we had now data that supported more devices in the classroom were needed. When you have data that supports this kind of demand or request that you want to make, the chances that the demand or request will be granted becomes higher. So using technology and having a gadget for all students actually slowly began to become a reality in the real world. We still have a long way to go. Many of our classrooms still don't have gadgets and computers. And having a computer lab in a school for grades 1 through 10 is not the best use of technology. You need the technology in the classroom for the teaching and learning purpose. When students go to a computer lab and sit at a machine, and over there also there are two or three students sharing a machine, not much good learning is happening. You cannot learn how to use a laptop or a, a, a smartphone or an iPad by sharing it with other people and looking at what other people are doing with it. You learn how to use these when you use them yourself, independently, in total control of that gadget. Then you are learning well. It is concluded that a classroom needs roughly one computer for every four students if students are to have the kind of access they need to engage in significant technology-supported projects. The one to four is a very limited ratio. We certainly would like to see a device for every student. And today, we are not even talking of computers. We are talking really of smartphones. We are not even talking of laptops. We are not even talking of iPads. We are talking of smartphones, small devices for every student. But I do understand this is seen as a luxury. And many of our schools and classrooms will not be able to do that. In such cases, we need to make sure 
that there is at least one computer for four students. That way, even if you have a computer lab in the school, you need to look at your largest class size, divide that by four to see how many machines you actually need so that students will have exposure and use with the machines.